no matter where I go, no matter where I've been, I will see your goodness, Lord, in the land I'm living in. What a declaration. Uh, We're gathering today to continue this journey, this eight-week journey of learning what it looks like to be growing in spiritual maturity, to becoming more like Jesus. If you're a follower of Jesus, I know your heart's desire is that day by day you become more like the one who saved you. If you're not yet a follower of Jesus, this series can give you a clear picture of what it means to be a Christian. It's not just to pop in on church for an hour, a couple times a month, and "Ah, I'm a Christian. No, it's our our whole lives being changed. And so you see up in the center of the screen here these different uh, pictures that kind of show us Basically, what, what is it that the scripture says it looks like when we're growing up in faith? And so, so Bible engagement. A growing Christian is one that's growing and knowing and loving and following the word of God. Passionate prayer. We're talking with God. We're, we're, we're walking in a relationship with him that, that's open and communicating with him. There's wholehearted worship we're going to focus on today. Our worship for God comes from the core of who we are. And we celebrate his goodness. Humble service. Jesus gave his life for us with humility. We're called to serve like Jesus. Joyful generosity. Pastor Sean was just talking about that. Not just that we are generous, but that we find joy in sharing in the work of Jesus. Consistent community. Being the family of God together wherever we are. Organic outreach. Shining the light of Jesus. These are things that, that, that show that our lives are growing up more and more to who Jesus would have us be because we're becoming like our Savior. And we, what we're doing in this series is not just kind of having a series of sermons. There's small groups going on. There's other resources. But there's two things I want to encourage you to do if you haven't started yet. Maybe you're here for the first week or online with us for the first week. But there's two things I want to encourage you to do. Number one, if you haven't yet taken the spiritual growth self-assessment, it takes about 15 minutes. It's all it takes. You can go on the Shoreline website. It's right there. If you can't find it, call the office. We'll walk you through the process. And you do this. You answer the series of 35 questions. You give your email address, and immediately, within like about three to five seconds, you get back how you're doing in those seven areas, where areas you're strong, areas you need to grow, and ideas for how you can grow. You can look at those ideas and kind of design your own pathway of growth. Boy, I'm kind of low in these two areas. I want to be more like Jesus. I'm going to work on those. Well, here's ideas of what you can do. It's all laid out there for you. We created all that here at Shoreline Church for you and for other churches that are using it all over the world now. But we created it here for you. And so we want to encourage you to do that. And here's the bonus. If at the bottom, of, at the end of those 35 questions, there's the question, do you want to meet with someone and talk about it? If you click on that button, your results will come to us. If you don't click on the button, the results won't come to us. We won't have your name and your information. That's just between you and Jesus. If you want it that way, that's fine. But if you're like, I want to meet with someone, then click on that button. So I met with somebody this last week who, who I got there, I got there, and we about an hour, we talked and we prayed about their life, and we talked about ways they can be growing in areas they want to be growing. It was, a, it, was a, it was one of the highlights of my week last week, was meeting with a church member who I had met with before. And just walking, and Sherry's done this with a number of people, other staff members have met with people. So if you click that button, we would love to meet with you one-on-one. If you're online, you can click that button, and we will meet with you in a Zoom call if that's what you want to do. But we want to just help you design a journey of growth. That's number one. That would take you to the next level. I encourage you to do that if you haven't done it yet. Number two, we have a book called Organic Disciples that we want, want you to follow along in and read if you're able to do that. And so, and so that book, we have it here at the church. If you're online, you can come by the church and pick one up at the, at the front desk here. When you come in the lobby, there's some that will have books. You can get those to you. And here's what we're doing with the books like we always do. If you can afford to get a book, great, get a book. If you can't, just pick one up. We'll give it to you. And if you can afford to pay for an extra one or two, I had a guy call me last week or sent me a note last week. He said, hey, Pastor, I'm coming by. He's been online right now. I'm coming by to pick up my book, and I'm going to pay for 10 more books for somebody who can't afford it. So everyone can have one. So if you don't have a book that you're following along on, you can pick one up today or come in this week and pick that up. And if you don't like to read but you like to listen, you can go onto Amazon and download the book. We can't give that to you for free because Amazon owns that one. We, didn't, we can't buy those ones. And that book, actually, Sherry and I read the book. To come in, not to your home and read it to you, but we read it online, and you can follow that way. But we want you to go deeper in becoming more like Jesus. And today, our focal point is on this topic of wholehearted worship. The marker of wholehearted worship. And and as you know, if you've been following along with us the last couple of weeks, with each of the kind of the indicators or markers of our spiritual growth, we talk about movement one is kind of how did Jesus model that or teach that? How did Jesus show us what it looks like to grow spiritually? Then movement two, we talk about how then how do I grow spiritually to be more like Jesus? And movement three is when I'm learning from Jesus, when I'm becoming more like Jesus, when I walk out into the world, how do I show the world that Jesus is real? And wholehearted worship actually has power to change the world. We know it delights the heart of God. We know it blesses us, but it has power to change the world. So this first movement of of kind of learning from Jesus, 
We learn this. Our God is worthy of worship. The God that we worship is absolutely worthy of all the worship we can give him and more. He, he deserves all the praise, the honor, and the glory. And so the Bible has sort of visions of worship, pictures of what worship can look like. And one of those visions is found in Revelation chapter 4. It'll be on the screen here and at home, uh, online, and it'll also be uh, uh, in, in the family worship venue outdoors. But if you want to follow along, turn to your Bibles to Revelation chapter 4. And there's this beautiful picture. I want you not just to hear the words, but to picture what's happening in your mind. Revelation 4.10. The 24 elders... Fall down before him who sits on the throne, before our living God. They fall down before him who sits on the throne, and, and they worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne. That picture of laying their crowns down is a surrender. They give all they have, what is most precious. They lay their, their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our Lord and God to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. They lay their crowns before the throne. In this message today, I'm going to give you two personal challenges. And usually pastors tend to give the personal challenges at the end of the sermon. I'm going to give both of them right in the front. And then I'm going to come back to them at the end of the sermon and remind you of these two things. But I want to give you two challenges that if you're a follower of Jesus, you want to grow as a worshiper, you'd really take these seriously. Here's exercise number one, challenge number one. Lay it down. Take your throne, take, take your crown and lay it down. Lay it before the Lord. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, the picture of taking their crowns and laying them before, before the Lord is this picture of taking all that is precious, all that matters, all that we value, all that's part of our lives. And lay, part of our worship is laying our lives before the living God, giving him everything we are and all that we have. But I want to get practical with you. I want to challenge you. In the next couple of days, you would find a quiet time if you can you know, navigate where you can have nobody else around, and you actually, you actually lay some things down, like physically lay them down. So if you have a car, you take your car keys, and you, and you say, Lord, I lay down my car. Here's my key. I just, I lay it down. It, it belongs to you. I, I, I worship you all that I am. I lay it before you. If, you have, if you have a house or apartment or a trailer, you take those keys, and you put them in the pile. Lord, I lay it down, all that I am and all that I have. You take the material things you have in your mind and you say, Lord, I lay them down. I remember, I remember the day I had a chance to decide if I was going to lay down before the Lord my Martin guitar. I played guitar. I still play guitar, but I used to play a lot more. I led worship like once a month for about 20 years. When I came here, we got people like Cole who are wonderfully gifted, so you don't need me anymore, and I, I don't do that here. But, but, um, but, I still, but I had this beautiful Martin guitar, and this younger worship leader asked me if he could borrow it to lead worship in a, like this young adult gathering. I said, sure. You know, all I have belongs to the Lord. Of course, you can borrow it. So he borrows it. I come back to my office the next day. It's on the stand where he borrowed it from. And there's about 150 scratches down the face in the wood. Because he's a really heavy pick and he's a downstroke kind of guy. And he wasn't paying attention. And I had to decide. Did I really lay it down before the Lord? <laughs> right? And so I, just, I said, Lord, I lay it down. It's yours. And, and he talked to me, and he didn't even notice it. The next time he came to my office, he saw, he said, did I do that? And we had this conversation. He said, well, I could pay to have it fixed. And I said, you know what? It'll cost more to have it fixed than you have. But I said, that's okay. And every time I pick up that guitar and play it, and I can look at the scratches down the face of that guitar, and I can say, this is the Lord's. He can deal with the scratches, right? But that, you all lay, lay it down. So our, our, our material things. But then, what, what if we say, okay, Lord, I come before you, and I would, I would challenge you to say, God, I lay before you my future, I lay my schedule, how I, how I spend my days. I lay, I lay before you my bucket list of all the things I'd like to do in this life. And I say, I give it all to you, Lord. Can you lay that down? Because that's your act of worship. Paul says in Romans 12, you saw the passage at the beginning of the, of the message here up on the screen. You offer your bodies, that's your whole self, as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Lay your life down. And what if you go a little bit further and you say, okay, you know, I'm gonna lay people before the Lord. And so you take your phone and you pull up a picture of your grandchild or your child and you set it down and you say, Lord, I give them to you. I lay them down. I lay my marriage down. I lay my aspirations and hopes relationally. I lay them down before you, Lord. This is your spiritual act of worship, giving your whole life to the Lord. Those you love the most, those who are precious to you, Lord, I give them all to you. 
What does it look like to say, I lay my life down? That's a challenge I want to give you today, so you would actually take some time, and some of you are going to go like this. You're going to go, oh, yeah, yeah, I got the concept. Yeah, lay everything down. I'm not talking about you have the concept. I'm talking about take 10 or 15 minutes and think about the things that are most precious to you. And take something that, that can kind of represent them or in your heart and just say, Lord, I lay them down before you. I entrust them to you as my act of worship. That's the picture. Casting down your crowns. Laying down all you have and all you are before the Lord. Lay it down. And then another vision of worship comes in the next chapter of the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 5, beginning in verse 13. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. That's Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, who died on the cross for our sins. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. Here's my challenges. Lay it down. Here's the second challenge. And bow down. Find a quiet place and get on your knees. And bow down physically before the Lord. If you say, man, my knees don't work that way anymore, I can't bow, then, then, then lay, on, lay on a bed or lay somewhere comfortable, but lay flat on your back or flat on your face and say, God, I bow down and I surrender to you and I give you all that I am. I offer myself a living sacrifice, all that I am before you. There's something about the physical posture. You know, the Bible talks about in worship about lifting holy hands. It talks about bowing down, kneeling down. Why? Because we're embodied people. We're not just spirits floating around. We are people in bodies, but our bodies reflect what's happening on the inside. And so not only that you would lay down all you have and all you are, but you would take some time to physically bow down before the Lord. And it might kind of feel kind of weird at first, or maybe something you haven't done before. But, but even the, the, wor the word worship itself, the word worship means to bow down, to lay before the Lord, to surrender yourself. That's what the word worship means. It's this act of surrender. And so I want to challenge you, just like we see in, in these heavenly visions of worship, that you would lay down your crowns, lay down all that you have before the Lord and say, God, this is part of my worship, and that you would physically bow down and just, just see what happens. Just try it. And again, I, I've been a pastor a long time. I know there's people listening going, yeah, yeah, gotcha, I understand the concept, but that's not for me. But your call. But can I challenge you to just let your body get involved and let your act of laying things before the Lord become actions of worship. Because worship is, is a whole lot more than what happens here when we gather together, what happens online when we gather together for an hour and 15 minutes on a Sunday. It's all that we are and all that we do. And so because worship is so important, I want to give some worship warnings. These are warnings that I've learned as a pastor, warnings I've learned as I've read the scriptures. But I want to give you some warnings when it comes to this topic of worship. Here's the first one. Beware the business of worship. Be, don't let worship become transactional, become a business. What do I mean by that? Don't let worship become this. Okay, God, I showed up for an hour on Sunday. Now you should answer my prayers. We got a deal here. We got an arrangement. You know, it's a business transaction. I come to worship. You do what I ask you to do. And if you don't, you're going to disappoint. Don't let worship become that. For some people, they're in worship to keep their parents off their back or their spouse off their back. It's a business deal. I'll come to worship, now leave me alone with all that religious stuff. Don't let it be that. If you're gathered right now online, if you're gathered right now on our campus, and you're here because you feel the pressure of someone else, oh, I'm here, I'm keeping them happy. Don't let worship be that. Would you dare, for the rest of this service, and this Wednesday night at Wednesday night of worship, and next Sunday as we gather, would you say, God, let me come, not to keep my parents happy or my spouse happy. happy. Let me, it's not a tra business transaction with them. I want to come and give you glory. And if you don't know who he is, open your heart. Because when you meet Jesus, when you encounter him, you want to give him praise. You want to worship him. You want to give him glory. So don't, don't, beware that, that your worship not become a business transaction. Here's another warning. Some people won't get it, and that's okay. Some people won't get it. They'll see you as a worshiper. They'll see you giving your life to Jesus, surrendering to him, going to church, but also just living for Jesus day by day. Our, our worship is all of our life. And some people won't get it that you are now, that God is first in your life. They won't understand it. That's okay. When I became a Christian, mo only one person in my family was a Christian, and in my entire extended family, over 100 people, only at that point, only two people, and me, now three people were Christians. 
I had friends that didn't understand why I wouldn't do what I used to do, why I was living in a different way. But that's okay. They didn't have to understand. I just wanted to keep following Jesus. So even when people don't get why you are so enthusiastic about Jesus, so passionate about worship, why you live your life the way you do, keep following Jesus. A worship warning. Choose wisely what or who you will worship. Be very careful. Choose wisely. Don't let any person take a place above God in your life. They can become the focal point of your worship. That becomes a form of idolatry. Don't let your own wants and desires become first. Don't let your job rule and reign in your life. Make sure God is first and above all. Because worship is a condition over your heart and your life. And if you're spending 50 or 60 hours a week working and you punch the clock for one hour and 10 minutes of worship every week so you can be over with that, my guess is that your focal point of worship isn't really the living God. Check yourself and say, is is my worship really focused where it needs to be? What am I worshiping? Who am I worshiping? Worship warnings. This comes from John chapter four. It's about the heart and not the location. It's not about the location. I thank God that we have this building. I thank God that we have a place to gather together. But at the end of the day, worship is not about the place you are. It's about who you're focused on. It's about the glory of God. So Jesus in John chapter four, when he encounters this woman who's broken and hurting, and, and, and they have this long extended conversation. And it's about the right place to worship. It's one of the key themes. And she was Samaritan, so she believed that Mount Gerizim was the right place to worship. Jesus was a Jewish rabbi, so she said, well, you'll think that Jerusalem is the right place to worship. And they were debating about the location. And as, as they're debating about the location, as all of this is going on, then Jesus, in the midst of this conversation, he says to her in verse 23 of John chapter 4, yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. It's not about the place. Not, it's not Jerusalem. It's not Mount Gerizim. You can worship anywhere. Now, it's nice to have a church building. It's nice to gather together. And God calls us to be together. But at the end of the day, it's not about the location. It's about the condition of our hearts glorifying God. A worship warning. Following Jesus in the flow of life is worship. Worship is so big. It's about walking with Jesus, loving Jesus, seeking his face, bringing him glory, talking with him, living for him through the flow of your day. And one more worship warning. Don't miss the chance to be together with the family. There is something wonderful and powerful about being together with God's people. And and when you have an opportunity, whether it's in a small group, whether it's in a a setting where you're in your home with other people just kind of hanging out that are Christians, when you can be with the people of God, there's something beautiful and powerful about that. And we'll talk more about that. But, but, but don't miss those opportunities. So, so movement one is to understand that God is worthy of your worship. So we lay it down and we bow down and we glorify God when we gather, when we're scattered all the time, every day as part of our lives. But now we can look at our lives. Worship is the lifestyle of a disciple. If a disciple is a follower of Jesus and Jesus called us and taught us to worship and revealed himself as worthy of worship and called us to worship the Father, And and so worship is a lifestyle. If you're a follower of Jesus, worship is what you do. It's not where you go once a week. It's what you do all week long. So you take a quiet walk along the coast or you do a hike up in the Fort Ord Hills and you see the beauty of creation and you lift your eyes above the creation to the creator and you say, I worship you, I praise you, I adore you. You tuck a little one into bed and they kind of doze off and they're not moving anymore. They're still and quiet. You just take a moment and say, oh, Lord, for all the challenges, for all the joys, I thank you for this privilege of being a parent, of being a grandparent, being an aunt or an uncle, and I just thank you for this little one. And I worship you for this good gift. And we turn our eyes to heaven. We turn our eyes to God. When you see beautiful art, when you're together with friends who love Jesus and the Spirit is present. I've got a buddy of mine who I've known for years. There's nothing he likes more than sitting around a roaring fire and talking with other Christians, and just talking about life and, and just being together with God's people. There's something about it. He, he had a home here in, in, this, in this area where he had kind of a, fire, uh, a, a fireplace in the middle of this courtyard area. And we had many times just sitting and talking together and just sharing what it meant to be followers of Jesus and to love him. And there was a sense of the Spirit's presence. And we were worshiping in that time of fellowship because God was there with us. And of course, in a church service. I mean, this, this, we can worship like this too. This is part of it. But, but don't let this be, well, this is worship. I do it. And then, and then, you know, then in about you know, 30, 30 minutes, I'm done worshiping for the week. No. It's so much more. It's so much more beautiful. And so there's the unique power 
and beauty of gathered worship. As we worship together, we have to understand there's something, there's something different and unique that happens when we gather together with God's people. Is God with you when you're out walking and you know, hiking alone or on a long run alone? Is God there? Absolutely. Is God with you when you're with a small group of people? Absolutely. But there is something about God's people gathering together. There's a reason why all through the Bible, God calls his people to come together. In the Old Testament, celebrations, festivals, times of rejoicing, times of repentance. But together, in community, worshiping God together. There's, and then all through the New Testament, the sense of God is building a church to be together. And so I would say this, the Spirit of God is present in a unique way when we gather together. Now, the Spirit of God is with us. When you're a Christian, the Spirit of God moves in and never leaves you. But there's, there's just this unique, beautiful way that when God's people gather together to corporately lift their voices and worship Him, that God shows up in a different way. And you felt it. If you're, if, if you're a follower, you know, I felt those moments where you just, God is near in a special way as we're worshiping our, our lifting of our hearts and our lives and our voices to the living God that the hearts and the voices of God's people matter to God. God. God cares about the condition of your heart. He cares about your voice. And when we together lift up praise to God, it brings him delight and joy. We know that gathering with God's people is important because there's places that will hold memories. All through life, there's things that happen in a certain place. You'll never forget that place because that's where this happened. And it's locked in your memory. But Pastor Sean, who led us so beautifully in prayer today, would tell you that in this room, at a night of worship, when he was teaching at the Naval Postgraduate School, full-time in the military, it was in this place that the Spirit of God, on a night of worship, this Wednesday coming up is a night of worship, on a night of worship here at Shoreline Church, and you ask him the story sometime, that the Spirit of God spoke to him and said, Sean, you spent a lifetime in the military. The rest of your life, you're going to spend serving me. And since then, he became a pastor here. Do you think this place means something? You know, some of you prayed to receive Jesus in this place. So we, we delight in those places that hold our hearts and hold memories, and that's part of our corporate worship. And then I would just say that God likes it when we're together. I, don't to, I can't totally figure out exactly why, how that works, but you can't read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. You can't read the Bible and not recognize that God really likes it when his people are together. That right now, and when I say together, I don't just mean in this room. I mean in this room, in the courtyard, in the family worship venue, and online. Our hearts are bound together. We are in one movement of worship together, studying the scriptures, singing together, praying together. And God looks at this and just goes, I like that. God delights in it. We give a gift to God because the focal point of worship is God. Not me, not you. It's God's glory. And he loves it when we come together. So I want to encourage you to keep, you know, keep making that an important part of your life. In Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 to 25, there's this amazing passage that really highlights the importance of encouraging each other, challenging each other in a way that happens when we're together and gathering together. In Hebrews 10, verse 23, you read this. Let us hold unswervingly, I mean, stay the course, stay focused. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he, our God, who promised is faithful. And let us consider, listen to this, how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. We're to challenge each other, encourage each other. That happens when we're together. We cheer each other on to love and good deeds, to live for Jesus. And then verse 25, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Not giving up meeting together. Well, we've had two years where... Life circumstances, global circumstances, have made it challenging. You know, mandates and all these things, they've made it hard. But, but I want to give a challenge. And I want to give this to everyone who's online and everyone who's on campus. Keep taking the appropriate steps to be together with God's people. Together like this. Together, together in the same place when you can. If you're online and you have health challenges and health issues and you're being careful about that, we honor that, we respect that, and we're going to keep doing the best we can to make the best online services possible and serve you as long as you need that. And we will do that. But if you're at home and you're there because it's more convenient and you like to worship in your PJs or whatever it is and you're like, hey, that, that works. I can worship and fold my laundry. Um, I want to challenge you as soon as you can to re-engage. Now, we have people in the military that are all over the world. Other people are around that can't be here. But if you're local and you're not coming because it's, it's an inconvenience to you, here's my challenge. Get inconvenienced and gather with God's people. And we have outdoor worship still. Live stream outdoors. You can show up, get a coffee, get a donut, 
Bring your own chairs, sit, you know, whatever space you need. Out of, we got that. We've got indoor in the family worship venue, which is family pods. And we've got in the worship center here, and we'll keep doing online. We want to serve everyone wherever they're at. But this is my challenge. Here, here's the challenge. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Let's continue to gather and let's move back towards that. And again, we don't know what's coming next in the world. We don't know what's going to happen. But as we're able to, let's not have gotten habits of not being in community when God says, I want you to be in community. Let's continue to gather together. And then some wisdom in gathered worship. When we do gather with God's people together, there's some things that are just kind of simple points of wisdom that I want to share that would hope will be an encouragement to you. Here's the first one. In ga- gathered worship, when you're in the same space with people, my freedom should not stop your worship. My freedom in worship, how I worship, should not stop you from worshiping. So in other words, if the way I worship causes everyone in the room to stop worshiping and focus on me, it's a problem. I had a woman in our church in Michigan years ago, and I had this conversation with her, sweet, sweet lady. But she came from a church background where the people in the church during the service, they'd be, I mean, running around the aisles, they'd be screaming, hallelujah, I mean, screaming just... Constantly, that was like, that was kind of part of their culture. Well, she came to this church in the Midwest in Michigan, and it was kind of a little more reserved. So during the service or during the sermon sometimes, she'd be like, it'd be like in the middle of a sermon, she'd go, yes, glory, hallelujah. And I'd be like startled, you know, I'm trying to, you know, and the people around her and everyone's looking at her and it's like, and in her mind, be like, well, they shouldn't be looking at me. They should be focusing on Pastor Kevin, but she's, and so I talked to her after this one service where she was particularly, um, where she yelled a whole lot during the service. And I knew that there were, a couple hundred people that were probably having a hard time worshiping because she was having so much fun worshiping. Everybody following me? And so I said to her, listen, I love you. I love your heart. I love your passion. But I said, um, I said do you know that when you're, I said, when you're expressing yourself like that, I, said, I think people are looking at you more than Jesus. And she said, well, they shouldn't. They should focus on Jesus. I said, I agree. But I'm just telling you, they are. I said to her, I said, it seems to me like you'd probably like, and I didn't know at the time, I said, you'd like to like run around and scream all of you during the sermon. She said, I would. That's what I do at my other church. I said, okay, so here's the deal. When you're at that church, Run around and scream. That's fine. If that's the normal thing there, and it's not going to be distracting to anybody, but I said, when you're here, it's kind of like you know, read the room. Look at who's here and understand that your freedom shouldn't keep other... I said to her, if, if everyone's focusing on you, I asked her, if everyone's focused on you, I said, where are they no longer focusing? And she got it. You know what she said? On Jesus. I said, is that what you want? She said, no. So part, understand, be free to work. I mean, so we, you can lift your hands, you can kneel, you can, you can, but if you started like screaming in the middle of one of my sermons, I, I would probably go, you know, hey, that's not really how we, we roll here at Shoreline. I'm, I'm preaching, thank you. And then when you, you know, but, but uh, so we, does that make sense? Give me, nod your head, does that make sense? So we want to be free to worship, but our freedom shouldn't keep others from worshiping. Removing distractions. A lot of you, uh, went during a sermon, your Bible is on your, your phone or your iPad. You use that. Uh, some of you pull up the Shoreline app and you use the notes on the app to keep your sermon notes. Wonderful. But if you have technology that you're plugged into and it's distracting you while you're worshiping, if you've got a, a watch that is feeding you texts and calls and things all through a, a worship service and you kept being distracted by that thing, most of these devices have an off button or a sleep mode or a uh, airplane mode, and you can stop that stuff from coming in. You're like, but wait, you mean for an entire hour? I would not have access to the, everything else. I would just be focusing on Jesus? My answer would be yes. It, I want to encourage some of you that are really plugged in. You can know this. If, I mean, if, you've, if you've got like a pregnant wife who's at home and she's at like nine and a half months, then keep your technology on. But for most of us, most times, um, the ne- an hour from now is just fine. So I want to challenge you to watch out for those distractions, all right? And then there's what I call blessed surprises. This is a, there's things that happen when we're gathered together in worship. They can seem like distractions, but they're really just blessed surprises. Um, you, you, maybe there's a health issue. We've had this before. We're all be in the middle of preaching or a service, and we have a team called the Shoreline Emergency Response Team. We always have a person on campus who's ready for medical needs, safety needs, whatever it is, and they're trained people ready to do that. We've had a time where somebody's had a health issue. And I didn't go, oh, thanks for your heart issue. You're ruining my sermon. It's like, no, we stop, have a prayer for them. The cert person comes, get a couple people around. They help take care of them. You know, we, they'll go out or they'll, they'll, everything's fine. I said, okay, where were we in the sermon? And people will remind me and we'll pick it up again. I call that a blessed distraction. It's like, we're not, gonna, we're not putting on a show here. We're worshiping Jesus, amen? So when those things happen, that's okay. When somebody has a child... And the child gets really fussy and kind of erupts and really fussy. They say, oh, that's okay. That's a blessed distraction. Now, if they erupt for five or seven minutes, then it's different. I'm going to say, hey, you know, the family worship venue. It's all set up over there, and we encourage crying over there. Um, but you know, so, but you, know, you know what I'm saying, right? But the little things that pop up, we're not going to worry about it. We're just going to oh, that's just a blessed distraction. 
but it's not going to keep us from worshiping Jesus. And then finally, keeping God in the center. Just make sure as you worship that, that God is your focal point. When we gather together like this, whether we're online or on campus, the focal point is God. If I think that I'm the center of worship, it's all about me getting what I want. I've missed the whole point. It's about us giving God what he deserves. And when we do that, he fills us to overflowing. But let's keep our focal point on God. So, so Jesus calls us to worship, and Jesus is worthy of our worship. We grow as worshipers, but then can our worship, can our lives of worship actually impact the world? Can a worshiping church, a worshiping family, a worshiping person who lives as a worshiper all day long, all week long, and especially when we gather together like this, can, can our lives of worship help the world see that Jesus is, is, is risen and alive? I believe they can. So how can authentic and joyful worshipers reveal Jesus? How do our lives of worship reveal the presence of Jesus? And here's the first thing. Living every day as a worshiper, surrender to God's will, and aware of God's presence is a powerful witness. When you live your life focused on Jesus, living for him, honoring him, it is a witness to the world. People are going to see something different in you. In Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, and we saw this at the very beginning of the message, the Apostle Paul writes, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies, lay down your crowns, right? Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Give your, in the ancient world, offering your body wasn't just a physical thing. It was all that you are. It's the seed of all that you are. Offer your intellect, offer your body, offer your life, offer your resources, all you are. Offer your bodies to God. As a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. I mean, offering my whole life to God is worship? Yes, it's the ultimate act of worship. And then verse two, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. I could preach for four or five weeks on that one passage. But really, in a sense, what it's saying is this. It's saying, lay it down. Offer your whole self a living sacrifice. It's saying, bow down and worship God. Pleasing worship to God is our whole lives surrendered. Yes, when we gather together, we worship and sing with passion. But all through the week, we walk with God with that same passion. Keeping our eyes and hearts fixed on Jesus through life's storms tells a powerful story. You want your life to tell a story? You keep worshiping God and keep your eyes fixed on him and you keep growing as a worshiper even in the hard times. I don't have time to open it up and expound it right now, but in Acts chapter 16, the apostle Paul has been preaching Jesus. It says he was beaten severely and thrown into jail. He's doing exactly what he was supposed to be doing. He gets beaten severely publicly and then incarcerated and literally locked in jail. And late that night, what is Paul and his travel ministry companions doing while they're in jail? They're singing praise to God. Read Acts chapter 16. Before the chapter is done, the jailer and his family put their faith in Jesus. Why? Because they looked at these people in the midst of their pain and suffering and they still gave glory to God. Keep worshiping God even in the hard times. The world will notice. The world will wonder. And when they ask you why, and then through my life, I've had so many times in my life where people have asked me about the way I live, what I do, they'll say, well, why do you do this? Why do you think that way? When somebody asks me why about my faith, I always respond with a question back to them. It's the same question every time. When somebody asks me why, here's the question I ask them. Do you really want to know? Why do you do that? Why are you like that? I'll say, do you really want to know? And you know, they almost always say yes. Do you really want to know? Yeah, I want to know why you can keep singing while you're locked in jail, why you keep praising God when you went through that painful loss. Do you really want to know? And then you say, I, it's because of my relationship with Jesus. You tell your story, how Jesus has transformed your life. Living as a worshiper opens the door for others to encounter the living God. Living in the joy of the Lord makes people curious. Joyful people are a curiosity in our world and there's becoming fewer and fewer of them. People are tense and uptight and combative these days. But a person who just walks in the joy of the Lord, people become curious. What, what is it about her? What is it about him? Why, when you walk in that, that family's home, there just seems to be this joy. I, I know that life isn't perfect, but there's a joy. 
Worshippers who are filled with the joy of Jesus create curiosity for others to know who this Jesus is. Homes inhabited by the spirit of the living God feel different. If you live in, in your trailer, in your apartment, in your home, wherever you are, if you saturate that place with prayer and praise and worship, if you are worshipers in your home, there's something that happens in that place. There's a way that the Spirit of God is present in the same way that, that when you're in a church setting and there's, there's a church filled with worship and praise, I've had people walk into church settings and go, man, it just feels different in here. So yeah, God's present. The Spirit is present. That can happen in your home. As we were raising our kids, um, our home became this place that just that kids came to and wanted to be in. I remember we, I'd walk in sometimes, I'd, I'd come in the front door, and there'd be 20, 30, 40 pairs of shoes. In the wintertime, especially when it was like really mucky, if you know in the Midwest, we weren't, we weren't to take your shoes off when you come in the house, but if there were like snow and muck and mud, they'd, and so I remember I'd walk in, there'd be shoes everywhere. One time Sherry took a picture of, I don't know, it was probably 30 pairs of, 30 pairs of shoes, our whole entry was just covered with shoes. But why did all these kids want to be there? I think part of it was the fact that there was a presence of the peace and the glory of the spirit of Jesus Christ in our home because we worshiped in our home. We praised God in our home. We lived for Jesus in our home. And some of these kids, they didn't have that. And they couldn't put words around. They couldn't say, this is what's going on. They just knew when they walked in there, they could feel something different. And a number of those kids came to know Jesus through the years. God opened the door for that. Our life as worshipers opens the door for the presence of Jesus. And then a church that gathers in the joy and power of Jesus is attractive and beautiful. When we gather in the joy of Jesus, the power of Jesus, as worshipers of Jesus, it's an attractive and beautiful thing, even if people don't really know what's going on. I'm gonna ask the worship team to come and join me if they would. And we're gonna, I'm gonna, we got a little bonus for you. We're gonna send you off with one song that we're gonna worship and, and, and sing together as we close and worship and song. We, worship is so much bigger than songs, but songs are part of it. But a church that gathers in the joy and the power of Jesus is attractive and beautiful. There's people that will walk onto this campus or walk into this place and they will feel something different. One of my sisters, before she became a Christian, eventually myself, my brother, and all three of my sisters became Christians out of an atheistic home, but the last one to become a Christian, she would talk about going into churches and she'd say, sometimes I just go into these churches and I just cry. Or they start singing these songs and I cry. She'd go, why, why, why is that? And I said, because it's the presence of the Spirit of God. That God's capturing your heart. So could we pray that Shoreline Church would be a place so saturated in worship of Jesus and praise of God and giving him glory that when people walk in, they would feel something different. Lord, that's our prayer. Our prayer is that in our homes, in our personal lives, in our workplaces, we would be worshipers. On our school campuses, we would keep our eyes fixed on you, Jesus, in the toughest of moments to lift our eyes up beyond the school, beyond the teachers, beyond the things, to the glory of God. In our workplaces, Lord, we would lift our eyes and see the presence of Jesus in our social settings and in, in, on golf courses and playing, playing pickleball and wherever we go, whatever we do, Lord, may we be your worshipers focused on you, Jesus. And in all moments, at all times, that we would raise a hallelujah, raise a word of praise, that we would glorify you and lift you up and praise your name. So Lord, in this moment, as we close this time together, lifting our hearts and our voices as worshipers, 